I have here Judai Rialloe, not Judy. It's spelled like Judy with an I, but it's Judai. But I'm really excited to have you here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your invitation and also to be able to connect with you. It's really amazing to see all of the work that you've been doing for the Asian American community, minorities. I know you work a lot with LGBTQ communities, women entrepreneurs, you work with nonprofits. And Judai here is an expert in Sun Tzu's art of war. And you would probably be thinking if you're watching this, what does Sun Tzu's art of war have to do with leadership and with life? And she isn't just your average leader, I would say. And I know her through, you know, the shamanic circle and through the energy healing space. And so she is someone who integrates and practices a deep inner spiritual life and integrates it with her, her business life, which is very much mundane and dealing with other things, right? And, and putting the two together, and that's really beautiful to see. She's appeared in numerous media publications like Philadelphia Inquirer, because you're based in Philadelphia. Yes, um, yes. The Philadelphia Business Journal, also in Korean Quarterly, ABC, CBS, Fox, Nickelodeon. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And she's also featured in two books, The Coach's Journey and The Height of Power. And I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about Sun Tzu and the art of war and, and you and how you put all that together. Oh, well, thank you, Johnson. I really appreciate the introduction and and really how you just have this sensibility about you that just gets to the essence of things. So I, I want this to be, of course, informative as well as entertaining. Uh, I wish I could reach out to people and say, oh my gosh, what questions do you have? I'm going to go over a lot of information and the information can be a little bit dense. So for me, my healing journey started, as I mentioned, when I was 29 years old. I was working on Wall Street. I always had a dream when I was younger that I'd work on Wall Street, that I'd have stick straight hair and I'd carry a briefcase. Well, that didn't happen. Obviously my hair is not stick straight and by then briefcases were not in vogue. But I did pursue my dream of working on Wall Street. Unfortunately, energetically, I wasn't very compatible at that time with working on Wall Street, the practices. But I did get to see what it's like to be in that Yang power paradigm. And we'll go into a little bit about that later. I started out as a healthy 29 year old and ended up in a slow progression of losing my ability to walk, to eat solid foods, to even just even leave the house. And I'm sure many of us can relate because we're in quarantine right now. And we're feeling a change in the quality of our life. And that was the, the basis of me delving into my spirituality. I had volunteered at a mega institute of holistic studies in Rhinebeck, New York, and spent time there as a seasonal volunteer. And that's when I really started my shamanic journey. My tent mate at the time, she was from Canada, and she said, you know, I'm going to this really cool class. You should come. And I said, oh, um, what is it about? And she said, it's intro to shamanic journey. And I thought, oh, that sounds great. So I went along and I met her there and they dispersed drums and I was like, what is all of this? It rattles and I had no clue what it was about. It's an intro class. And in that intro class, I had an experience. It was more than my, just an experience. I had, it was my initiation. It was my first initiation into the calling of studying shamanism and where I was, you could say, dimensionalized uh, as my mentor put it and where I could feel, I could understand, I could see, I could perceive everything that was going on in the room at this one time and the interconnectedness of every single person and thing in the world. I ended up coming back and with the callback and started a little bit because uh, my mentor, the, the leader of the workshop said, oh, you were just initiated as a shaman. And I went, great, what's that all about? <laughs> I love when that happens. That happened to me also. I have a similar story. And, and what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, what do you mean I'm a healer? And, and this is something that in the shamanic world, in the healing world, there is this concept that you see everyone as an enlightened Buddha. You see everyone with their fullest innate capacity to, to heal, to, to heal themselves first and foremost, and then to share that with mm -hmm. others. And so how did you take that and then move into Sun Tzu and then incorporating that with the work that you do with, 
women's leadership and business? So I took that information of the sudden initiation and I still refused the calling as many of us do and still worked on Wall Street. And then, then that's when I got diagnosed with the Shin Byung or in Korean, that mysterious illness. And the only thing that could be taken away from it is being really initiated as a shaman. And so during that time period, I started studying. I exhausted all Western medical options. Most doctors said, okay, you're just depressed. And, and I'm like, oh, I had a really wonderful, fantastic life. I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm sure many of you might be able to relate. They just wrote me off like, okay. I was on 21 different drugs and supplements, and I thought there has to be another way. So when I exhausted Western medical options, I started studying more so Eastern or alternative medicine. And that started to lead me down the path, more so of shamanic healing practices, as well as integrating it with Sun Tzu, which I had started reading when I was 16 years old, when I had left the Catholic Church and decided that that no longer pertained to me. And I was looking for a new spiritual path. So I started with Sun Tzu, the, the I Ching, and calligraphy, artistic practices, yoga, <laughs> which at the time was considered the occult, meditation, and, and really uh, steeping in those practices. And then, of course, uh, learning them more formally through various uh, practitioners and other teachers and mentors. What are the key points of Sun Tzu and how they apply? I know you go through something called the power paradigm. Is that yes. something that you've created or is that inspired from Sun Tzu? It is inspired from Sun Tzu. So as Johnson and I have both studied that no problem can be created on the same level of consciousness in which created it. And that comes from Einstein. And with Sun Tzu, he said, and I have one of the books here, for Sun Tzu, The Art of War, if you can see it. The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a road to either safety or ruin, hence it is the subject of inquiry, which on no account can be neglected. So in many cases, that was my life. It was a matter of life or death. It was a matter of safety or ruin. It became like any book that has been around for 2,500 years. And I'm sure some of you can think of the Bible or the Quran or really great wisdom pieces. A very short book for many people, uh, if you can see it's not very thick, but the wisdom that's contained in here was life-changing. So in that yang and yin paradigm, which is something that I've put together in terms of leadership, is in the yang paradigm, it's based off of fear, as we know. Level one being the level of the victim, which many people are feeling now. And number two, it could be the level of the persecutor, and they could feel that coronavirus is that persecutor right now. And then level three, uh, the rescuer. And in many cases, people are looking for their governments worldwide to be that rescuer. And we're going around this triangle of fear on that first tier of that yang par paradigm. If you think of it for most jobs, most jobs where the employer controls what time you go to and from work, uh, what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're entering into that yin par paradigm. My call it level four, the level of the facilitator. A great facilitator for many of you that are parents out there is a mother to a child or a father to a child. And then there's a level five, which Johnson and I are doing right now, is the collaborator, where we're seeking win-win spaces. And then level six, I call the explorer. And then uh, level seven, the co-creator. But those are in the new para paradigm. And most people, I would say, are centered in that new para paradigm of a place of instant manifestation for those who study the law of attraction. How do you define power? Because power itself can come across as a masculine force like that's very much associated with the the yang power power power. That's such a mouthful. The yang power paradigm that you just talked about. Is there any benefit in learning or moving through that triangle of disempowerment with persecutor, the victim, and the rescuer. Is there a benefit in that? And then moving into the different phases, does it work linearly? Is it something that happens in everyone's own unique process? Did you have to go yang, yin, then new power? How does that work? Like any process, uh, or as my yoga teacher would say, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the person. But everybody has different sectors of their lives. So for example, spirituality, health, fun, 
family, friends, and intimacy, career, uh, finances, and debt, and then one's own unique challenge in which we incarnate in, in this lifetime. For some people, they might be in a place of a level one, two, or three, uh, a place stuck in fear. Uh, for many of uh, people are right now, they're in a, that sort of place for their career, finances, and debt, or their relationship with money, or time, and perhaps even success. When you move into the so-called higher, now that like we know there's no such thing as higher or lower, but for humans, we need that, that level of reference into the higher levels of energy, into four and five, you'll find that life moves along a little bit differently. You're more in a receiving space. A lot of times you hear that people are resistant, I would call from a place of fear of level one, two, and three, and from four, five, and six, it's more of a receiving space, more of a space of surrender, a space of intuition, wisdom, experience, all wonder, joy, bliss, ecstasy, <laughs> and just uh, in terms of energy, a different qualitative experience of life, one could say. But like any experience, it's of your choosing. And so there is no one answer that fits all that people move from yang to yin to new. People can be in different, as I mentioned, in different sectors and different places in their lives, and that's okay. But what we often find is a lot of our clients are like, like ourselves, and they tend to be in the forms of perhaps women or LGBTQT uh, or minority leaders. And so we have unique challenges because a lot of our limited beliefs, as we've talked with, with Johnston about, come from either family, friends, culture, media, and society. So for example, how that's played out, especially for women, we just had equal pay day for black women in the United States, where an African-American woman might earn 68 cents to a Caucasian man's dollar and how long it takes her to make that. So already society is telling her her value and how she internalizes that from being having this form, this culture, these limited beliefs that stop her when she's asking for perhaps when she is an entrepreneur and asking for what she's worth, what her full price is, and then why people might be resonating with that energy, some of that stuff in the book, uh, those issues, and then they want to bargain with her and they, they might try to have what she's giving. And so it's energy, right? What you give is what you receive and what you're holding is also what you're receiving from the universe too. That's beautiful. And it's really reminiscent to the Sun Tzu quote where he says, victorious warriors win first and then go to war while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. And thank you for pulling that one out. Another one that I like uh, that Sun Tzu says, I can see who will win or will lose first those with the the greatest knowledge with the method and the and the way have great abilities but those with the knowledge of heaven and earth those are the ones that are invincible and those are the ones that will win first in comparison to going out to battle in life we have these battles and we have these conflicts they can be internal or external conflicts but one thing that has remained that has completely shaped human history since the beginning of time is conflict so really Sun Tzu is, if you want to call it, at least for me, my Bible about how to master the mystery of conflict and really go into that new power paradigm. Now you can see the new power paradigm all over on this planet. Back in the day, women fought to wear pants because they were wearing skirts and now men are uh, that wearing pants are fighting to wear skirts. And you can see it in, in <laughs> you can see it in the bathrooms, where before it was strictly men's and women's bathrooms, and now there's the family bathroom, or there's that new power paradigm. There's also a lot of drag that's becoming more mainstream now. I mean, you look at the phenomena of RuPaul's Drag Race and how that has enabled men to get in touch with their feminine side, even to the point where there's a celebrity version where men are feeling that the toxic masculine old power paradigm of behaving and being macho and putting up this veneer no longer serves them and so now they're all getting in touch with a different aspect of self people are crossing crossing the veil now between what is perceived as right or wrong and that's it's strange and also exciting to witness at the same time because it's 
it's not what I grew up with, right? I don't think it's what you grew up oh, with. Man. We grew up with binary. We grew up with ones and zeros, right? Where it's either off or on. And people define themselves particularly this way. One of our clients is now retired in the sense uh, of of drag, but he, and still defines himself as a he, excuse me, I got a little something in my eye. He was a burlesque drag dancer and a feminist touting feminist literature too, uh, often in his performances. The depth of of who we serve and what's going on in this world, we really are going into the place of what I call infinity. So in Sun Tzu, with the basics of the binary, if we could just take that of what we used to call the givens in our society, he would say there are <laughs> more than five musical notes, yet the combinations of these give rise to more melodies that can never be heard. There are five primary colors, blue, yellow, red, white, and black or you could say uh, even colors of the medicine wheel. Yet in combination, they produce more hues than have ever been seen. There are more than five cardinal tastes, sour, acrid, salt, sweet, and bitter. Yet combinations of them yield more flavors than have ever been tasted. And in battle, or I'd say in conflict, in which we are humans, uh, often in a state of conflict or can be, and depending on where we are. and. There are not more than two methods of attack, the direct and the indirect, so the yang and the yin. Yet these two in combination give rise to an endless series of maneuvers. So the endless series of maneuvers, we're, call it, we're talking that new power paradigm, that the indirect and the direct lead onto each other in turn, paradox, duality, the 3D existence here on earth, holding two ends of the spectrum, is moving in a circle, in that infinity, and who can exhaust the possibilities of their combinations? And that's what we're talking about, that yang and the yin paradigm, moving into that new power paradigm, where just like we were talking about with drag and that old expression of toxic masculinity and getting touch with their yin side and creating this new power paradigm, this new expression. There's just so much applicability to what's going on, not only just a little bit in society that we can see of our inner landscape being mirrored outside into our external worlds of what's happening in the dynamics on this planet, but also in our own lives and our own stories. We talked a little bit about the, the yang and the yin paradigm and the new paradigm. And then I did mention a little bit about the method and the way as well as heaven and earth. And then Johnson mentioned the leader. So we are the expression of the method and the way and heaven and earth. Just like in shamanic terms, the various elements make us up as a leader. What you brought up about conflict is very on point because we're constantly engaged in external and internal challenges. And you know, when you look at Sun Tzu's Art of War, you would think from its title, okay, I'm going to learn how to win and beat and step on people. But a lot of his work is very much about the inner conflict with yourself and how to overcome that so that you can manifest from a place of abundance and peace from within before you go step on other people's toes and like knock down their fortress walls. Yeah, you think, oh my gosh, this is for military commanders when actuality it is uh, the entire premise is how to win without fighting and if you think of it that way how can you win without fighting fighting or that concept of fighting is really as i mentioned before more so along or stepping on toes is more along that yang power paradigm what a lot of us grew up in uh, we've only had or seen in many cases that masculine leadership or that masculine leadership style as we mentioned, the toxicity, as what we can see in our environment, or that imbalance with economics and environmentalism, or that imbalance in leadership, or that imbalance in all different sectors uh, of yeah. our lives right now. And I love the parallels from the, the five different layers, the five elements, the five tastes, all of that. And it really parallels with what you said, the medicine wheel. And so some people who are listening may not understand or are familiar with the medicine wheel which is a concept or practice in the shamanic traditions all around the world it's a healing practice where you move through the cardinal directions and really work through certain issues pertaining to self-healing and also to 
working with your destiny and bringing that into your being. Speaking in terms of shamanism, you yourself have had many parallel experiences in shamanic healing with Peruvian shamans as I have myself. And, and so I wanted to touch a little bit on the cleansing of what in the East would be known as karma, or if we're talking mm -hmm. epigenetics, cultural, generational, societal stories that really impede us on our journey towards success, right? As a change maker, right? You're really big into working with change makers. So people who have small businesses or entrepreneurs or working for organizations, I mean, these, your, your passion, basically, how do we get out of our own way? And I think, you know, in my point of view, I'm sure you share this as well, is that a lot of it is imprinted in mm -hmm. things that we didn't even create. It came from our parents and their parents, and it just keeps going back generations after generations. And so you do something called DNA clearing. And, you know, mm -hmm. I do something in my own way that's very similar. And, and so talk a little bit about this clearing that needs to be done. Sure. So Johnson, thank you for just prefacing it. And I'm sure some of the people that you work with might be a little bit familiar, so I don't have to go too far in depth and detail. What's often touted today is epigenetics or the idea of emotional trauma passed down through lineages from seven generations is what we often say. You hear it all the time. Oh my gosh. For some people, their parents might have had cancer at a particular age and when they turn that age they happen the gene expression goes on and they happen to get cancer too you can see it in people's personal lives where somebody was divorced their parents were divorced in kindergarten oh my gosh when their five-year-old is about to go to kindergarten what happens to them in their own personal relationship uh, they end up getting a divorce or separating in, in particular ways so uh what the, the healers that I learned it from, from Northern Peru, and I worked with them for whew, uh, over 10 years. There's a special on them on Discovery, and they're really amazing. They're soul twins. So they look very similar to each other, but they're not fraternal or identical twins. And I'll go into a little bit about that later with my own experience. When we talk about these wounds or these, these generational karma or this energy or these stories, whether you call them past life stories or current life stories or future life stories or what have you that are in our blood that are circulating around as an adoptee uh, i know that my blood comes from my biological parents in an epigenetic term though but uh, the people that raised me have another set of influences another set of what johnson and i would call limited beliefs that colored my lens of what the world looks like and how the world will receive me as an individual and how I will also receive the world. So in that essence, what we're doing is we're doing just like what happened right before we started, a restart. My computer completely restarted and uh, had to turn itself back on. So we're doing a genetic, we're clearing that energy from our, not just our own particular bloodlines, but seven generations back, which is so exciting. In my own personal experience, I'm adopted and I've always wanted to know about my biological family. When I was sick, it turns out I, I'm allergic to land animals or meat and meat proteins and all sorts of funky little things that are like, oh, I didn't even know that was humanly possible. I've always wanted to have a, a family and be closer to my family. My family, uh, which I was adopted in, they have their own, of course, challenges, issues, wounds, problems, whatever level of thinking that where you are uh, with addiction. So I grew up in a space which I would call a, a toxic or a dysfunctional love in comparison to a healthier mutual reciprocity or just uh, a, a warmer sense of love. So uh, for any of you that grew up with addiction in your family, what that feels like, a feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm stuck in this cycle. And why can't I get out of this cycle? I attract people like my parents. I, I in job situations like my parents, and I just want to really cut those ties. That's what this experience is all about, the DNA cleansing. So in my own personal experience, I got the DNA cleansing. These people like go out and do it up in the North America because we're down in South America. And we all have these bloodlines, these wounds for seven generations that we've been carrying around. It's interesting because you were adopted. So you not only had your biological 
unknown to <laughs> clear, but you also had inherited yes. energetically from the people who raised you, just being around them, you had to work through <laughs> that as well. So you had <laughs> double clearing. Yes, I had to do double clearing. Yes, double hucha. The unknown hucha and the hucha, Johnson and I have studied in a very similar capacity. Hucha is like a negative or dense energy, a compacted energy. So I had double hucha, correct. At that point in time, I cut the ties with my adopted parents. And then what dropped in, I'd actually done a DNA test. What dropped in was a biological relatives from Amsterdam. Because that was obvious. And, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm sure you all saw that coming. So my biological relatives from Amsterdam were the closest living relatives to me. We were in the same countries at the same time. We study the same subjects. Uh, we're very similar. We both love foreign languages. She speaks nine, I speak five. I call myself the dumb, lazy American. She studied opera, and I've always loved opera, pansori style, Korean style opera, or just singing. Just a whole bunch of different expressions that are dokato, same, same, as we'd say in Korean, that you couldn't almost deny, like, oh, okay, check, 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 check. <laughs> like, uh, we're almost mirrors of each other. We meet up in Bali, Indonesia. We have a blast. We're like two kindred spirits. She can't eat half the same stuff that I can't. And, you know, and it's just it was such a life affirming experience that I've never had that somebody that looks similar to me, but also has the same genetic predispositions as I do. And uh, we get along like two peas in the pod. What we found out much later on was that perhaps that there were two children because we were in the same orphanages at the same time. There were perhaps two children under the same file. And the idea that, you know, because we don't know our backstory, that we might be indeed some sort of twins or fraternal twins or something like that. We don't know. And we could go on for further testing, but we're both relatively happy of where we are in that journey and stay in touch with each other. And for a period of time, decided to work on trauma together and our heritage trauma. That's amazing. That's a wild story that, you know, you found your biological sister in Amsterdam after doing all of this spiritual work, things happen for in mysterious ways, right? Don't they? And we're always ready for them in the right time that they show up. And I guess it had to happen in that way for you. And that's, that's pretty awesome. It is rather awesome. I did rather, I did reconnect with my adopted family too. And our relationship has been amazing in comparison to what it was before. So when people uh, say, Jude, I, I've heard about you do DNA cleansing. I would love to get more information or I'd love to embark on the program. I always say, be ready. Be ready for something so miraculous that you aren't even aware of what that miracle, you don't even have a vision. What You don't even have that vision of what that miracle could be. That's how big and broad and just like you said, things just drop in when you're ready. The universe delivers when you're ready. And I'm sure you, when you're dealing with clients too, like when you transform, you say, oh, I really want this and I really want that. And, and you have the, an idea, you have an inkling of what you would love to manifest. And then the universe takes that. And when you work with somebody like Johnson or myself and just says, here you go, here's something amazing that was beyond your idea that you could even dream of. It's, a lot of it comes from just peeling off the different layers that have been consciously or unconsciously placed on ourselves. And then things will just click into place. And, and then we can take the vision that we have. And that vision becomes something wilder and broader and more vast than we ever could have hoped for. And that's when we really come to dance with life, with the universe, and we become participatory instead of victims to the circumstances, right? Like I've honestly been thriving during COVID. I know a lot of people who have been suffering, but that's honestly a choice deep down to work on those things or to not work on those things. And in times of crisis and in times of non-crisis, you want to observe yourself and where you are sitting in your relationship with what you want. And it's really that. Are, are we able to proclaim and to claim what we want or are we hesitant and deciding to stay in complacency? And then part of it 
is that is the unspoken hidden invisible karmic energetic blueprints that are trapped in your chakra system and your energy field that you can't see because it's your shadow and your blind spot but others who are trained in it can see right and that's why you know people like you exist people like me exist and it's very much about helping each other as a community to break free of those emotional and mental roadblocks and that that really is it that's how we sure add more purpose and fulfillment into our lives i love everything that you're doing i love how you've taken sun tzu's art of war and turned it into a guidebook for success and i love how level-headed and practical you are in structuring mm. all of this mystical seemingly like oh god new agey stuff what is this I'm into something that's tangible and applicable to life and that's pretty amazing are there any last words that you might have for people? Because I know we can talk on and on about this. But any last tips that you have about cultivating a deep inner spiritual life as a change maker and, and also grounding it into actionable ways? I'm glad that you bring this up because many people, many teachers that are out there are in that Yang power paradigm where it's the traditional education system where it's do, 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 do. Sounds like do, do after a while. What people have forgotten is that we are indeed human beings. So from that Yang perspective, yes, do, 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 action, Mars, woohoo. From that Yin perspective, we are in a state of grace. We are in a state of, of love uh, as much as we can be, unconditional love. And really just a state of receiving. So our, our award-winning methodology, because we won the Best Business Center, as you mentioned, for underserved uh, women, LGBTQT, minority leaders, Women's Biz Cup, we won that in 2017, is based off of think, believe, and do. So two-thirds of our process is on that yin of what, your, what are your thoughts? What do you truly believe? And then, of course, how does it affect you when you do? So the Sun Tzu, the methodology of Sun Tzu, is that application into uh, our our Women's Biz Co-op, C-O-O-P. Mom's like, what's a coop? Women's Biz Coop, what is that? <laughs> like, it's a co-op. It's member-driven. It's, it's input. It's a, it's a different way of being. It's not in that traditional form. And really taking spiritual grounding as part of that practice in our 12 step we do we have a program start my business day 12 steps in 12 weeks we start with the foundation of who you are because most people will talk about your idea or even we eventually start talking about your calling or your passion your purpose and your mission but really all of that begins with you you're the seed of that you're the one who's been given this by the universe to carry this mission out, to carry this calling, this purpose that you think is larger than you, but it's always been a part of you. So how do we tease? How do we pull? How do we unfold that from you? And we spend a third of the program based off of that before we get into market research or before we get into websites or social media before we get into how do we incorporate or how do we even find funding and then launch you out i love this part launch them out into the greater world because uh, many of us might not have the networks to fund us if you're wang fantastic at the age of i don't know later age she decided to ask her dad for a million dollars to get her clothing label started many of us unfortunately don't have parents that could write out uh, or transfer the money and say here you go kiddo so to be in these networks, to be in these spaces, and we have a 1.6 million member network and help people get up to $15,000 as seed funding. And people who have fallen through the cracks, people whose credit that isn't so great, in that Yang Paraparium system, people that uh, might be homeless or refugees or immigrants uh, that are undocumented. But you know what, we're all humans. And we're all here for a reason. We're all stepped into this existence right now. And we're here to help each other out. Uh, we're here to uplift and empower each other. Like you mentioned during COVID, some people are definitely are suffering and other people are thriving. And really it's a choice. That's what it comes down to. But when you're in those levels, one, two, and three, you don't feel like you even have a choice. Usually when people are reverberating at a level four, five, six and above, then that's when they're like, oh, I know it's a choice. I can choose something different and this is where I am. And that's okay, wherever you are. 
So we help people wherever they are along that power paradigm and help them move into a, a state of more graciousness, a smoother life that's full of wonder, perhaps, dare I say, miracles. We've had so many miracles. Many of our clients even get clients. They're like, Joda, we're not even incorporated yet. I'm like, I know, it's so much fun, isn't it? So just enjoying that wild ride when they say, yes, I'm going to choose something different. Yes, I'm going to live differently. Yes, think, believe, and do life differently. That's our slogan. My current partner sometimes, he can't believe. He's like, you're doing what? What happened? What's going, what? <laughs> like, it's just miracles, consistent miracles, things that I, I don't even dream about. I was writing a book, for example, and there were two people that I was hesitant to reach out to. One who's connected to the big O, Oprah, and another one is connected to Marianne Williamson. So these spiritual leaders are very well respected and exceedingly busy. And I reached out to other people that are my friends that I worked with. And, and I'm like, oh, would you mind doing an endorsement for my book, et cetera, et cetera. But I held back from these two people because I was in a, a place of like, oh, why would they even consider doing something for me, right? But with our system, now these, uh, for me, it's at an unconscious basis. I didn't reach out to them. And what ended up happening is those people or those people that are connected to them ended up reaching out to me pretty much the same day. And my partner's like, oh my gosh, you didn't even like reach out to them. You didn't even, like you thought about it, you were afraid, and then you worked through your, your level one, two, and three stuff. And then things popped into existence. And before you know it, instead of me feeling yang, having to go out, I'm in this space of yin, in the space of receiving. It's really that, staying in the state of grace and of receptivity and allowing and giving permission, finding pause and stillness, which is not our patriarchal go-to. We're not taught to do that. We're trained to strive and to cling. And that's what we basically learn from age five, once we get enrolled into the education system, right? And to sit and to wait is probably one of the hardest things that most people will have to learn in their lives. But once we do, right, things start to flow. It becomes an effortless effort. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom, your insight, your sharing, your stories, and... Thank you too, Johnson. It's really been a delight. Yes, thank you so much. And everyone go live your miracles, go become the miracle. Thanks so much for watching and see you all next time for another episode of Truth, Wisdom, Freedom Conversations.